um in today's episode i have got deshraj deshraj is a phd student in speech recognition from john hopkins university he is also a dear friend of mine we know each other since we used to do silly things in high school so i am so excited to have him here and talk about speech recognition asr and all the cool stuff he is working on and we'll try to understand what these things are beyond hype so before we go uh into the questions i would like deshraj to introduce himself sure hey vipul um it's great to uh, meet up again first we have been friends for a while now you said high school but i think we go back to middle school or even primary school if yeah. i remember right um but anyway um as vipul mentioned i'm i'm desh uh, i'm a now uh, late stage so i i'm in my 6th year now a 6th year phd student at johns hopkins uh, where i do Uh, things with speech recognition speaker derivation a lot of other speech processing uh, applications is mostly revolving around applying deep learning to language technologies yeah, and uh, i've done a couple of interns um, at meta microsoft uh, in the past i worked at samsung so i think i have experience on both academia and industry so i'm looking forward to um, this talk and see what what we can learn from each other sure so before we move forward i want to understand and I, it will also help our viewers and listeners that what exactly are you working on because we have we, we know computer vision a lot of you know applications we have seen we have seen llms but what are you working on sure um before i get into what i do um, let me was tell you what speech recognition is it's uh, very commonly used now so it's basically speech to text and in in academia we call it speech recognition um or asr commonly um this is you give it some utterance as input you're talking to a device and you convert it into text and the whole idea behind that is once you have a text of what the speaker is speaking then you can do lot of processing with that so you you can if you have a a huge stack of natural language understanding um pipeline you can take the t- uh, transcription and run it through that to maybe generate a response to the user or th- things like that so usually uh, in industry or in applications it's used as a kind of interface between the user and the device so that's where asr comes in me specifically if you uh, my work is something we call multi talker speech recognition so if you uh, think about asr commonly these days Uh, the applications that that's it's used for the things that you would find are things like voice search or um, maybe it's it's used in like dial um, language learning for example if you're using duolingo for learning a new language so if you think about it all of these are kind of single user applications so there's one user who's speaking to the device but there's no um, kind of concept of a conversation happening but what we would like to get to eventually is a smart system which is participating in a conversation so you can imagine there's a um, a meeting going on with four or five people and you have an additional system which is sitting there which is also a participant in the conversation and you say things uh, like um, or can you verify this for me and then later it can summarize the conversation attributing some stuff to some speakers and you can say this this person uh um, his viewpoint was so and so and so on so for these kinds of applications what you would need is the system to not only transcribe one speaker but to have the whole knowledge of what everyone said at different points of time and this is where the multi talker speech recognition part part comes in so the whole uh, question that i'm um, trying to solve is who spoke what and when so that can be used as kind of uh solving this this uh, uh, eventual task and in in uh, uh, this has been uh, very commonly addressed and uh, in um, common uh, language it's it's often referred to as the cocktail party problem so the idea is that there's a cocktail party happening and as as is the, the case in cocktail parties there's m- several people and you want to um, see what everyone is saying so yeah that's the, that's the problem briefly put um so what makes this problem so hard or so interesting 
that you mm-hmm. decided to spend 6 years on that so why is diarization rization or you know multi speaker problem harder than the other yeah. facets according to you i mean what yeah. is it interesting so uh, my point of view is that as we keep growing in technology we are we keep trying to address uh, more difficult problems so 30 years ago when speech recognition was first uh, ma- became mainstream and started being used people were still kind of doing digit recognition tasks so they were just using it for simple say yes no command or just recognizing one two and so these this was what was called, called isolated word recognition but even then the eventual goal was always to have the system understand whole conversations although we didn't have the technical capability at the time to do that and over the years once once systems became good at that the natural next step was okay now can i understand continuous speech recognition so, so continuous large vocabulary continuous speech so lv scr became like the next goal um, to 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 solve and then uh, maybe like 5 6 years ago after deep learning became big and uh, people um, found that if you train your system with large amount of data you can do very well at this large vocabulary continuous speech recognition the next challenge was okay now that we have we can transcribe a single speaker speaking fluently well uh, can we now do uh, several other things so among these several other things things are like can you do can you transcribe people with different accents can you transcribe uh, people with a lot of when there's a lot of noise in the background so suppose i'm sitting in a restaurant and speaking to my phone often it 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 kind of is a very big challenge so a lot of communities um, started working on these from different directions so there's a whole a big signal processing community which has been trying to solve this problem from a front end perspective to reduce the noise to reduce background speech mm-hmm. uh, but in general this is a, a challenging problem and it involves looking at it from different angles and so when i first started my phd we uh, i participated in this challenge which was called chime six chime mm-hmm. challenge and the series of chime challenges has been going on for like the last 6 7 years or or even more and the the whole goal like when it was it was started to the with the goal of improving asr in the presence of background noise background speech so in general making asr more robust so i, I figured it would be a good uh, transition especially uh, during this time when i started my phd we were going from more traditional systems towards more end to end systems as we call them and so bringing in those ideas from the end to end systems and see if we can leverage the power of those systems to um, have some improvement in these conditions as well so that that's uh, why i got into this pretty interesting so uh, one question which pops into my head is um so for example i have worked a little bit with vision and also with text the data set of text is usually smaller as compared mm-hmm. to I mean, it is easier to compress and all, as compared to vision. But I, I, I don't understand how the. So, for example, for me, it is very intuitive to understand that a image is a matrix, RGB values at every, you know, every point. How do you represent speech as a mathematical block, and how do you do these essentially matrix multiplications on top of that? So, yeah, uh, how is that? That's a, that's a good technical question. So, in in text, it's it's very straightforward because once you tokenize text, you have essentially represented them as digital discrete tokens. So that's you can work with that. Uh, vision, I haven't worked with vision much, but I, as you said, you have blocks of images, so RGB values. So you represent them as matrices. Audio is different because audio naturally occurs in an analog state, and when we work. Mm. with them in digital systems we have to uh, convert them to digital stage so people recognize this like very early like um, decades ago and they used all these kinds of sampling methods so you will hear about um, this this audio is sampled at uh, 20, um, 16 kilohertz this is sampled at 44.1 kilohertz or something so that just uh, essentially means that you're taking the analog signal and you're sampling it if if it's 16 kilohertz that means you're six, sampling it 16000 times in one second and and that those samples then become uh, you can imagine a sequence of floating point um, real values um, and that is essentially what you're giving to the system but of course that is a huge number so if you, if you uh, think about it for a 10 second 
uh, long uh, speech that is like 160,000 samples. And that mm. is huge. And that's the problem that you have when you're working with audio as opposed to working with text. Because mm. text naturally, because how we have evolved as humans, we have learned to compress all this information when speaking into these texts and uh, in, in the language and uh, the information is very compressed. But audio comes with all these uh, in extra information, like within these 160,000 samples, you have information about what was spoken, who was speaking it, what was the emotion that they were trying to convey, but also what's going on in the background. So all of that is present in that, um, that sequence. And then the problem becomes how you extract the information that you want from that sequence. So there's a lot of methods for that. Uh, but th that is a whole uh, six month uh, course, I, I would think. <laughs> sure. So uh, I think this these problems inherently might have benefited by the by the um, advent of transformers because it works on sequence. It is end to end. So did transformers actually impact your field? Or it yeah, was not yeah, that sure. as with every other field, um, speech has been uh, uh, since since Transformers came about and they started doing well, people adapted Transformers. Um, so it turns out that um, since I, I told you about this huge sequence, right? But if you think about it, uh, for language understanding tasks, uh, it's you would probably need to have the whole context of the 10 mm -hmm. seconds. But if you're just trying to, for example, transcribe, what you would probably need is just the local context. So maybe what was said like one second mm. ago or something like that, um, unless you are adding language modeling, but that's a different topic. But anyway, so the point is that um, you have to adapt those models. You, it's, it's, um, it's hard to directly use them for in a new modality like audio because audio has more information in the local context than it is in the global context. So soon people realized this and then they came up with variants of the transformer. So things that uh, one of the models that is very popularly used is called the conformer. So it's, it's a variant of transformer where you additionally have a convolution layer in there just to make it more biased towards the local context as opposed to the global context. And then there's uh, um, tons of variants because um, unlike language processing, usually when you have to uh, use ASR in applications, you want it to be streaming. So I don't want to wait until the end of the recording to start transcribing. So then you have mm -hmm. to do all kinds of uh, masking on the attention matrix to make sure that you don't use any right context. So you're only using left context for processing. So things like that. But yeah, there's, it's a huge uh, line of research. So um, transform is just an encoder architecture, but just but even otherwise from a modeling perspective, also from mm. what output units you use. So whether you're using phonemes or graphemes or DPEs and there's like tons of research happening. It's, it's a very uh, open area and uh, we're still improving things. Sure. Uh, okay, so some fun questions before we move forward. Um, so you always have been a great fiction reader. I mean, very avid fiction reader. And now you are pursuing a PhD. So where what I'm trying to say is that, um, so I was interviewing Thorsten Ball. Um, he he has written a book and he said that there is a inherent benefit in doing, um, doing things which don't have immediate outcomes. So for example, if I watch a video, there is I know that after 20 minutes, there's an outcome. After 10 seconds, there is an outcome. But doing things like PhD or even reading a novel, which is, I know that you have read very thick novels in your life. I want to understand how do you, uh, how do these things uh, help you out when you are dealing with a critical problem? How do you sit with a problem for a while? What's your thought process like? Because especially in industry or, you know, young folks, they don't learn how to solve it if you... Are, uh, if you have read or heard of the name of the book by po po Poela or Polia, some mathematician had written it. How do you solve it? How do you solve a problem? So mm -hmm. I want to understand that from a PhD perspective, that how do you take a problem, sit, it, sit for it for six years? And obviously you're making progress, but sometimes it may not be measurable. So mm -hmm. how is that process like? Yeah. Um, so that, that question is, is a bit different for different fields because if you 
asks someone from a theory who's doing theory, then maybe you try to solve and come up with a theorem or try to prove something for a year or two years without making any progress. And suddenly there's a Eureka moment and you, you mm -hmm. find it. But in an applied field like ASR, it's, it's kind of different because you do have measurable progress that you make mm -hmm. every, say, every month. And it doesn't just have to be in terms of improving accuracy on a benchmark. It can be making the model more efficient or uh, faster in inference or, or just more, small measurable, like quantifiable improvements such as those. So in that sense, I, I would say it's not so much about uh, sticking with a problem for too long and just trying out one solution. It's more like we try a bunch of different things and you have to know when to give up on one approach because a, a lot of times I've seen what happens uh, especially in the early stages of PhD is you think you have a smart uh, solution. So you try it out. It doesn't work. So you keep trying. You try a different benchmark. You try improving it a bit more. Um, but at some point, you have to realize maybe it's, it's the solution is, is just not working. And then you have to move on to the next, um, next uh, strategy or the next solution. So that uh, uh, point of... Yeah, giving up, it's a bit hard because you're stuck with that and you're trying to work at it for three months or six, even six months. But that is critical in ensuring that you keep making progress. And since you have worked uh, at both Meta, you have also done an Amazon fellowship, if I remember. So how does, how, how that work is different from what you are doing in academy and how do these things help each other out? How do these things complement each other? So uh, I have been fortunate to uh, have worked directly with people in industry in, in a lot of ways. So through workshop where I worked with folks from Google and Microsoft, but also through these internships. And in, in, uh, in, the field, in a field such as ours, it's very helpful because um, a lot of times um, the things that we work on are kind of motivated by what problems those teams are facing in, when they're building actual products. So, the, for example, the kind of the robust ASR work that I did was actually because uh, Meta was uh, working on these mm -hmm. AR classes and they were having actual issues uh, when when uh, trying to transcribe that. So it, it helps to know that the things that we work on are actually in the next several months are going to go uh, into an actual product that people will use. So in that mm -hmm. sense, it's it's they are complementary. So the industry always kind of provides the problem that you want to work on. But of course, as academia, uh, you have to um, think about a, a bit about the longer, long, uh, the big picture. And um, you have to kind of find the right balance uh, between short term gains of improving, say, 1% water rate on this benchmark versus mm -hmm. doing something which has more of a long term impact. So that balance is some sometimes a bit tricky to find, but but yeah, if you find it, it's it works well. Cool. Now I want to talk to you about um, something which happened to you on February twenty twenty third. That is twenty twenty three. That is your papers got accepted in IEEE. But I'm more interested in uh, asking you this: that you have used self supervised models, and I have heard Jan Lekun talk about. Um, that self-supervised models are the right way to go, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So what are self-supervised models? How are they different? Like, it sounds so complicated that, you know, they somebody self-supervising itself. So, so what are those things? And do you think that these things have genuine value in the future? Or what's your take on yeah. this? Okay, yeah, good question. So it's it's just a way of training. So if you think about the let's think about ASR and how we how we you would train a model. So given some recording and audio input, you're basically trying to find a text sequence corresponding to that audio. That's the ASR problem. If you have millions of utterances and they're corresponding the, the paired utterances, or or even in things like machine translation, you would have say German and English pairs you can train a big neural network to, to learn this mapping. So this mapping can be represented as a function in a high dimensional space. And then you're kind of trying to learn this mapping. That's what a neural, neural network is. And then you find smart ways to learn this mapping. But mm -hmm. the problem happens when you do not have this um, millions of paired data. 
because getting those millions of pair data is very expensive. Using uh, often in ASR, you would hire um, a whole lot of transcribers, annotators to listen to the audio and transcribe it. Or in machine translation, you would hire translators to translate mm -hmm. a million um, sentences. So the, the promise of self-supervised learning is that you can train a neural network without actually having this paired data. And that, mm -hmm. how you do that is um, through different tricks. So often, for example, if you take the example of language modeling, how language modeling works is that you try to predict the next word based on some history, the context that you have. And so if you think about it, this is kind of supervision in itself. So although you, are, you still have this, the whole concept of giving an input, which is the history and trying to predict some output, which is the next word, the supervision, supervision is coming from the text itself because you can just mine the whole internet and each of the sentence will give you a supervision because you're just predicting the next word. So you don't have to give um, the sentence to anyone to tell you what the supervision should be. And that's the whole idea that you want to create a training task where the supervision is easily defined and how easy easily you can get that supervision makes the problem much more cheap uh, to, to solve. So um, what a lot of people realized is that if you train a model in this self-supervised fashion, you're basically training it to learn kind of the domain that you're training it on. So for example, if I train it on a bunch of speech and how we, I would do it is similar to language modeling, for example. So I would give it the sequence of audio input and I would try to predict what happens after. So what's the uh, speech that would uh, occur after this? So just simple things like that. And then when you have, once you have trained it in a specific, in this way, it has kind of learned the underlying distribution of, of speech. And once you have done that, then you can kind of what you call fine tuning. Uh, you can fine tune this model on the downstream task. So there's this divide between upstream and downstream where the upstream is this simple pre-training strategy and the downstream is the task that you're actually interested in. So yeah, I mean, Jan Lacun is, is a visionary and of course he was right in saying that self-supervised models are the, the big thing and they are, uh, especially with um, low resource data. So I mentioned earlier that recognizing accents is a big issue. And especially if you have uh, say African accents where you do not have enough data to train models. And so um, these kinds of self-supervised strategies uh, help a lot in those cases. Mm. What is the fundamental problem between um, which which makes speech and text different? So I understand that we speak in a different way. Right now I'm talking to you in a different way. And if I would have um, sent you a message or written you a letter, it would have been completely different. So can you also point out what that difference is? It will help us in understanding the difference between these two fields a little better. Yeah. So a, a very simple example I can give you is if you write um, um, good morning, just this very simple word. Anyone in, of all the 8 billion people on earth, if they write good morning in English, they would write it exactly the same way. Uh, and mm -hmm. if you type it out, uh, I mean, not hand, hand, OCR is a different thing. But but yeah, they would just write good morning. That's all. Those are just, if you think of character, they are the four characters of good and the 10 or whatever characters of morning. But every one of those 8 billion people, if you record them saying good morning, they will speak it in a different way with different mm -hmm. accent or, or with different voice, a pitch, uh, say, for example. So the problem is that the underlying distribution is so wide. There's, there's so many variations that can happen when people speak. And I'm not even um, mentioning all the things that can happen in the background or the things with the recording, like, uh, your, div your even the, the microphone that you have used to record can be different. So all of these little variations, they make it super challenging to learn a good distribution. And mm. uh, you think about the generalization problem, the, whenever we train a machine learning model, our eventual goal is that it generalizes to um, an unseen test data. But if you have trained on say um, 1 billion people and then you test on the other billion, then it's gonna be hard. That's why we see all these problems when you have trained 
uh, uh, ASR system on American English and then you deploy it, for example, in India, mm -hmm. it, it's not going to work because it has it doesn't know how Indians speak. So it, it's, mm -hmm. it's all just a problem of learning, having a good estimate of the distribution. And, and that's what mm -hmm. we keep trying to do. And yeah. And it should be very hard to get clean speech data. For example, if we write something, especially when we type something, and if you want to scratch it out, we just hit a backspace and that text is clear. Mm -hmm. But while speaking something, let's say, I'm just like thinking out loud. For example, I say, hey, uh, Desh, can I, what do you, oh, okay, don't forget about that. That's not what I want to talk about. This is what I want to talk about. So how do you cut that context out and say, okay, this is not where what I want to pay attention to. And this is the real thing. I think that is an additional challenge in speech. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a big challenge. So read speech, the, the thing that you mentioned earlier. So if you think about things like audiobooks, um, mm -hmm. so audiobooks are easy because people usually read it in a quiet environment and they're reading directly from what whatever was written. So transcribing that is easy. Um, then we go to the next step, say things like broadcast news. So there it is kind of spontaneous or, or maybe TED Talks. Um, they are kind of spontaneous, but, but on the other hand, it's recorded well. And the speaker is, of course, has rehearsed and they are speaking very clearly they are not making a lot of these hesitations and things like that. So that is maybe the next uh, level of difficulty. Um, and as we move on, if we go into the real conversational setting, like how we are talking now, we have a lot of hesitations. We um, cut, cut ourselves and then we, we switch things. Um, so this kind of these kinds of conversational artifacts make conversational speech recognition very difficult. Fortunately, in the last few, several years, um, just progress in sequence modeling in general has been able to um, kind of go past all of this and uh, and still able to work with conversational data as well. Um, but still, like if it's it, it's it's not even uh, uh, not even from an input perspective, even from what you want from your application, it it depends, right? Because sometimes you may want exact verbatim transcriptions but maybe sometimes you want your asr to output transcripts which are readable so which which do not have all these hesitations or mm -hmm. uh, cle um, clearing of context or things like that so but yeah in general the uh, the solution depends a lot on about um, what exactly you want to get get from your recording yeah mm -hmm. and there's one more thing i'm forgetting the name of that um that phenomena so uh, it said something like speech is not a uh, it, it's speech and vision are very much related so sometimes uh, we infer by seeing what how the person is uh, emoting or the you know the lips as well because if you hear multiple words they sound same but we get an impression because we see the lips be moving in that way so yeah yeah, I think it's called the McGurk effect or something. I yeah, think. McGurk effect. Yeah, McGurk effect. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, it's that interesting, interesting. You 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 bring it up because only yesterday I was um, talking to a colleague about this, and uh, he mentioned mm. that yeah, like thirty years ago, if, if someone has been doing working on in this domain for like 30, 40 years, then they would always uh, cite the McGurk effect as a mm. uh, as a motivation for for doing um, a lot of this work um, on robust ASR. But yeah, that's as, as you mentioned, right? The, and what I, what I told him was, yeah, if you uh, look at these TikTok videos or the short funny videos that come up where someone is listening to a popular song and then mm. they, instead of the actual lyrics of the song, they write something funny on a board. And then when you read mm. that funny stuff, you, you actually, you can actually listen, hear that happening mm. in the song. So True. that's a very, uh, uh, like, that's McGurk effect in action, actually. So, so yeah, mm -hmm. what we hear depends a lot of, about uh, what we perceive through our other senses. And so recently, actually, uh, this, this idea of audiovisual speech recognition or just doing things from a more multimodal perspective has mm -hmm. become quite popular. It's, it's still challenging, mostly from an engineering perspective. Uh, yeah. Um, perspective because 
uh, handling all of these uh, modalities with all that information. It's just a hard problem. But I think that's the right way to go because that's how humans do it. We we use all of our senses, and I think um, that's that's a good step in the right direction. Hmm. All right. What about the other things you do, like rock climbing, playing <laughs> guitar? So how what how yeah. talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I I try to keep myself busy with other things. So. Uh, a lot of times what happens when you're doing a phd and you're so uh, involved in one problem is um especially when if of, often as i mentioned you spend 3 months 4 months on a problem and things are not working out so you have to uh, recognize especially in our field is that eventually you're building tools for language technologies i'm, I'm mm-hmm. not claiming that i'll what i build is going to change the world i'm just trying to make things easier for people to interface with devices a bit better so mm-hmm. and there's like thousands of people who are doing that so at the end of the day i'm doing it because i like doing applied math it it helps me uh, and i like uh, come uh, collaborating with a lot of similar like minded researchers across industry and academia so that those are my motivations um, so if the things don't work out it's fine uh, it's it's part of the job and then these ad- additional things help you to kind of stay grounded and realize that there's other things to life beyond just um what your phd is about so that's why i keep myself busy with that i i i like to i i, I took up climbing once i um started my phd soon after um and it 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 goes in waves so for for a few months i'm um, this, i like i i go climb then um if if i'm in india i i can't do that so i i go back to reading fiction so these days i've been reading more historical fiction um sometimes non fiction but i don't like non fiction that much um but yeah so these th- things i think just keep me sane in the long run and i would highly recommend anyone who's doing a phd to to have some kind of things other than what your research is mm. so we have talked a lot about failures in phd or in, in solving any complicated problem i would say but um i also want to ask because i have heard a lot about this that phd actually is a very lonely process and you know it is hard uh, because you see very few people do phd so it's not like everybody is pursuing graduation all of your friends mm-hmm. are doing the same thing Mm-hmm. so talk about that like does it affect you or you know you had at the cream layer where it doesn't matter <laughs> um i think i think your phd is what you make of it um mm-hmm. i think what you mentioned about the isolation and the and the like when people have this idea that a phd is like sitting in a corner doing your own stuff for 6 years but mm-hmm. of these days that's not how it works if you, you can look at the author list on papers and realize that there's like 15 people of them working on a project if it's a large project um, but even otherwise like personally i've always had fun collaborating with people so i i see um whenever i have i i start a new problem i try to find people who are experts in that or at least who have worked in that for a bit and try to um, engage with them collaborate with them so that helps me to uh, learn new things from them but also to Uh, expand my network so at this point um it it it's become very, very fun for me to go to conferences because a lot of time i meet people um who I have talked to before even virtually um mm. but but yeah i think in that sense uh, it's less isolated now especially in the applied deep learning or in this kind of language technologies field than you would have say 20 30 years ago when you were like a pure mathematician working on mm. proving stuff i don't know how that field is now but i would think that it, that it has changed as well i think the whole of academia has moved towards this direction where more open collaborations are encouraged mm. and um, they help they seem to turn they turn out to help more in research in the long run sure so before we go i want to ask this that how can somebody new start uh it's explore his exploration in or his or her exploration in the field of asr and 
you know also tinker with stuff so which tools to use where can we get a uh, data like cfar so things like that mm-hmm. so uh, when i started or maybe a few years before that say uh, mid 2010s um, the mm-hmm. the only tool out there was kaldi so kaldi was developed by my advisor dan povi um and it uh, it kind of was one of the first so there was htk before that but htk was notoriously hard to use even kaldi mm-hmm. is as some would say but but still like kaldi kind of set the stage for these open recipe like models so it would provide full recipes for downloading the data training it performing decoding mm-hmm. on that and it would do that for a bunch of different data sets so whichever data that you have access to there's a there's a few open source libri speech is one of the most popular again from my group um but um there's there's uh, several data be- behind uh, paywalls but there's now there's like lot of open source data available you can just download any one of them um uh, start training this so kaldi started this and set the stage for that but in the last 5 or 6 years people have come up with a bunch of new frameworks which are much easier to use they're all py- um, all python based often using pytorch uh, as the deep learning framework uh, mm-hmm. so there's things like esp net esp net mm-hmm. is um, by shinji watanabe who is now a professor at cmu um, and his um, group team of researchers so esp net claims or uh, is actually like a tool that you would use not just for esr but for any kind of speech processing application so it can use it for speech translation you know speech enhancement separation and so on so uh, regardless of where your inter- interest lies in speech you can use esp net there's a similar one called speech brain which was mm-hmm. recently uh, developed by some uh, researchers at mila in montreal and it's also can config driven and very easy to use for beginners these are really easy to use frameworks if you're a bit more advanced or you want to work specifically on asr with transducers then we have this um, series of tools so it's it's supposed to be the next generation kaldi um, um as we call it um they are uh, ice for let's say k2 so these are uh, uh, toolkits that we are developing right now with uh, at jhu and with my um co-advisor dan povi at xiaomi we did a tutorial on this at interspeech a few weeks back so those are some tools i think in terms of knowledge um these days everything has become end to end and you would probably just take uh, one of those end to end models and train it um, so most of the time what you need to do as a researcher is just to create the data appropriately so have the good input and have the appropriate supervision Hmm. but at the same time i think most of innovation comes from having more in depth knowledge about what's actually going on so i do feel hmm. there there is there's a lot of benefit in learning about things that were done in the past and how things have moved to this end to end thing so in the, in the last 30 years people used to do these kinds of noisy channel models so we call them hybrid asr there's less research on that now but it gives you a good perspective on how people used to think about the asr problem from a bayesian perspective for example and then build separate acoustic models language models dictionaries and then you can it would motivate you to think about why the shift towards end to end models came about and that was because uh, it's it's hard to it, those things required a lot of expert knowledge and and training just a neural network to uh, doesn't require you to be an expert you can be a um, good pytorch engineer and you can do that um, and you sure. if and if you know nothing about asr you can train a asr system in 2 days if you know how to yeah. train a neural network so yeah i think i think making any kind of progress i think for a beginner it's maybe i'm old fashioned but i think you should know the basics and where things came from to yeah. be able to um, contribute to where things are going Hmm. Awesome. I learned a lot. Thank you Desh for coming on the show and talking about ASR. I hope that you enjoyed uh, being on the show as well. And I hope that you will be back soon when I read more papers of yours and ask you some more, you know, we have a paper discussion of an hour 
you know someday mm-hmm. whenever you are free sure so, yeah sounds yeah. good it was great uh, talking to you and um, i hope uh, more people are interested in this and language technologies and in asr in general after uh, listening to this podcast thanks for having me